Welcome everyone. Happy September 1st. Thank you so much for joining us for this afternoon's conversation between artist Lee Mingwei and vocalist Berita Poulsen, sponsored by the Greenberg Steinhauser Forum in American Portraiture Conversation Series. I am Dorothy Moss, Curator of Painting and Sculpture at the National Portrait Gallery, and on behalf of Gwendolyn Dubois Shaw, the National Portrait Gallery Senior Historian and Acting Chief Curator, I'm so pleased to welcome you today. Because we will be showing images as part of today's presentation, we recommend that you select Gallery Active Speaker or Thumbnail View in the top right corner of your screen in order to better see our panelists. We have closed captioning available, which can be accessed along the bottom menu, as can the question and answer function into which you are welcome to submit questions for our speakers. Before beginning, I would also like to invite you to join us again on Tuesday, September 15th at 5 p.m. for the first installation of our six part Edgar P. Richardson lecture series on the theme of Women, Portraiture, and Power. Lectures will be held every other Tuesday evening beginning on September 15th, running through November 10th. Please visit our website for a full list of speakers and topics. With this afternoon's program, we continue a series of conversations on artistic strategies for activating museum spaces through live performance and object creation. We are pleased that National Portrait Gallery Associate Curator of Photographs, Leslie Oreña, will be moderating today's conversation. In 2018, I had the pleasure of co-curating with Leslie the presentation of Lee Mingwei's Sonic Blossom as part of the Portrait Gallery's performance arts in a series, Identify. Leslie's past exhibitions include One Life, Marian Anderson, and In Mid-Sentence. Her upcoming exhibitions include Block by Block, Naming Washington, opening in spring of 2021. And she is also on the team of curators who will open the Contemporary Portraiture Exhibition Kinship in 2022. And along with Taina Karagal, she will be co-curating the 2022 Outwin Buchiever Portrait Competition. Welcome, Leslie. Thank you so much, Dorothy, um, and for the kind introduction. And thank you to uh, Gwendolyn um, and to Portal for making the space for us to share the Portrait Gallery's curatorial work with audiences all over the world uh, through the Greenberg Steinhauser Forum in American Portraiture. These conversations have proven so crucial to have, especially during this time. And thank you, Jackie, uh, for your incredible work in organizing this event and managing all of the technical aspects of this afternoon and across many time zones that we have even today. So it is really my pleasure to uh, bring us in this conversation and we will be revisiting Li Ming Wei's Sonic Blossom. And next slide, please. Thank you, Jackie. Which in the spring of 2018 and April of that year transformed the portrait gallery's great hall, bringing together strangers through the shared experience of music evoking deeply emotive feelings for all involved, whether viewers, recipients, or singers. And before, next slide, please. Before we watch a clip of its presentation, I am delighted to introduce uh, and be in conversation today with Birita Polson and Li Ming Wei. Soprano Birita Polson was born and raised in the Faroe Islands, where she also began her musical education and from where she is joining us today. In 2015, she moved to Berlin to study at the Hans Eisler Hochschule für Musik with Professor Christine Schaefer and is now studying towards her master's degree. During her studies, she has sung various operatic roles with local orchestras such as uh, the DMSO and Contuti. And this past spring, she had her debut with the DSO Berlin conducted by Robin Ticciati. Paulson regularly visits her home country for performances of church music, song recitals, and opera, and has twice been invited to perform for Queen Margareta II. And during the lockdown, she was part of Li Ming Wei's virtual performance piece, Invitation for Dawn, about which we will hear more this afternoon. Thank you, Gurita, for being here with us this afternoon. 
And for Li Mingwei, he was born in Taiwan in 1964 and is currently living in Paris and New York. And Li Mingwei creates participatory installations where strangers can explore issues of trust, intimacy, and self-awareness and one-on-one -on -one events in which visitors explore these themes with the artists through eating, sleeping, walking, and conversation. Lee's projects are often open-ended scenarios for everyday interaction and take on different forms and change over the course of the exhibition. Lee received his MFA from Yale University in 1997 and has held solo exhibitions internationally, including at the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, the Museum of Modern Art, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Museum of Contemporary Art Taipei, the Queensland Gallery of Modern Art, the Mori Art Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Centre Pompidou, and the Gropius Bau, and has also been featured in biennials in Venice, Lyon, Liverpool, Taipei, Sydney, and as well as the Whitney Biennial and the uh, Asia Pacific Triennials. Mingwei and Burita, really it is a pleasure to speak with both of you this afternoon, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us and to share your work with us. Next slide, please. Uh, when our colleague Dorothy Moss, whom you met briefly uh, at the beginning of this, uh, initiated the Identify series in 2015, her goal was to make absence visible in our museum by building at, um, in our museum building by asking artists to respond to our collections of early portraiture with its many depictions of privileged, wealthy white men. And here on the left, you see um, the performance identified by Maria Magdalena Campos Bons and at right, um, Precious Indavada, a portrait of the Geechee by Sheldon Scott. Identify would interrupt and question these narratives. And as these 10 projects have unfolded in our spaces, they have not only brought our visitors into contact with a form of art not traditionally associated with portraiture, but also made us question even further how to ensure that we present history in all of its complexities. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who have attended the performances or been part of our series of conversations this summer, each identified performance really truly takes over the building or parts of it. And in the case of Sonic Blossom, the Great Hall became a concert hall, but one that was both intimate and public as it brought the gift of song to our visitors. And as you will see here with Molly Pinson Simoneau, um, you will see a get to experience Sonic Blossom at least virtually um, for a few minutes here. Jackie, can you please play the video? Thank you. Well, meet. <laughs>
Thank you, Jackie. Um, and um, as a reminder to those of us, um, those of you who are joining us today, please do feel free to enter questions um, in the Q&A section. Um, we will be uh, fielding those as the conversation goes along. So I'd like to invite uh, Mingwei and Birita to the I guess, virtual podium here. Um, and Mingwei, I would like to start uh, with you. Um, Sonic Blossom is a work that was first presented in 2013 and has since bloomed in Taipei and Tokyo, New York, Paris, and of course here in Washington as well. And I'd love to hear more, and I hope I think our, our guests would like to hear as well, um, more about how Sonic Blossom came to be. Yes. Hello everybody, this is Li Mingwei um, speaking to you from Manhattan. <laughs> uh, thank you, Leslie. Um, 2013, my mom was quite ill with a heart disease. So I went back to Taipei to take care of her doing her operation. When I was with her in the um, uh, intensive care, I played Schubert's leader for her. The reason why I play Schubert's leader is because my mom, who you see in the image holding my hand, that was Mingwei when I was four, so my mom uh, would play Schubert's leader in these hot summer nights, uh, especially when I was running around the garden like a little puppy. That probably drove everybody crazy. So she played Schubert's leader in a very small volume. And I would say, mom, could you please turn it up? I couldn't hear you. So mom being a very clever person, she told me, well, my dear, if you sit down and be very quiet, then you'll hear Schubert's music. So the reason I'm showing you this picture of my mom and myself is because that day was my first day to go to kindergarten. As you could tell, I wasn't very happy because I didn't want to go to kindergarten. However, mom spent six months making everything I was wear, I was wearing. Um, so that day, and she told me, if you ever thought of mom and wants mom to be next to you, just think that I made this for you and it is as if I'm next to you. So just to see how, uh, what a wise woman she is. When, um, when I was asked to create a project for the inauguration of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Korea, I thought it would be really lovely to share the um, beautiful song of uh, Schubert's lead with people. But this time, instead of singing to someone you know, I asked the singer to select someone that this is the gallery and it's, it's a stranger for the person. So it's really a gift between two strangers. So what you see on the other side, which is a rope on a, a mannequin, so I have designed this robe looking like a black upside down uh, tulip because for me, a black tulip is a mythical being. And uh, when I told the singers, when they wear this costume, they are demigods. They have the special power of giving a gift to a stranger using their voice. Next, please. So in the gallery, what you're gonna find is just a very simple chair with a stand where the singer will be placing uh, their speakers, uh, where the piano music is coming from. On the right side of the image, you can see a singer with this costume looking or meandering in the gallery in slow movement to make her encounter. Next. Once she found the possible receiver, she will ask her or him by saying, may I give you a gift of song? So this lady very happily is receiving the gift from this singer while everyone witness the intimate exchange between these two people. Next. It takes only about three and a half minutes and uh, the exchange is extremely intense. 
And after the singer sang, she bows and disappears into the crowd to look for her next encounter. Next. Yes. Thank you. No, and it was definitely um, something that, having witnessed it here at the portrait or at the, at the museum building, it was definitely something that I could see the intensity um, as each of the different performers uh, exchanged this gift um, with visitors who were surprised, really, to bump into these performances. And um, in the, Jackie, if we can go back to the last slide, please. Sorry. Um, and, you know, here it's in this specific, I don't know what the gallery space is at the museum in Seoul, but um, how it's a sort of an enclosed space that really gathered um, a group there um, for people to find the voice. And I don't know if you can speak a bit about how that, that space changed the performance there, or what you had envisioned, it was the first time it was performed and how that made an impact, I guess, on the, on the way that it was for you as the artist. Yes, yeah. I purposely selected the uh, corridor. The reasons because, uh, there are two reasons. One is that because this is a sound project and I didn't want my project to disturb other artists' installation, especially uh, video installations or installation with sound. So I asked them if there is any part of the museum that is gonna be uh, less disturbing to other artists. So they said, well, the only place we have is the corridor. And when I look at the corridor, I thought conceptually it would work really beautifully too, just because it's a transient experience. Plus it will be easier for the singer to encounter people who are not in a way prepared to receive uh, a gift of art or to encounter an experience because it's not really in the gallery space. Uh, so I thought this works really beautifully. And it's similar when we did it in the National Portrait Gallery, it's not in a particular gallery space, but in a space that is where people meet, encounter, and part. Right, thank you. Now that is, the Great Hall is, as we can see from the slide, especially on the first floor there, in the corridor there, is, there are no artworks displayed, there are side galleries for those of you who have not had a chance to visit, um, where there is art and also on the mezzanine. But we walked through the museum when you came to visit for a site visit and you know we said well we've had identified performances here and here and here and and we talked about what the concept was for identify and when you thought oh sonic blossom is is the project for this and i looked at, i don't think i've actually we talked about it back then but if you'd like to share how why sonic blossom seemed like the right fit um whether it was the space or the museum or the collection i'd love to hear more about that Yes, I always think, um, well, first of all, when I go to a city, I love me sitting in museums. And usually the first gallery I go to are the portrait galleries in different museums. So this could be portraitures from the Renaissance time to the National Portrait Gallery of um, Mrs. Obama uh, in the next gallery when the project was on. So this time I feel the portrait itself, the meaning of portrait could be extended to the person who is sitting at the chair. So now you are a living portrait of who you are. And in a way, it's an embodiment of the community where you came from. So I thought Sonic Blossom is a perfect fit for the National Portrait Gallery. And thank you so much. It was, it was really a pleasure to have the, this work with us for um, almost the entire month of April. And we had yes. 12 performers who really uh, surprised people as they were walking through the galleries. And uh, we have, well, here we have um, one of our singers, Rebecca Henry, kind of, you know, having a very um, nice encounter, I think, <laughs> with the person with whom she um, gave the gift to. And for, for those of you who are not necessarily familiar with your work, um, before encountering us here, or it would be great to, next slide please, go through sort of your other projects. I mean, you have, and we've only, in the interest of time, we've selected from your very long career, we've only included two, but um, we wanted to also bring in these two works, When Beauty Visits, uh, that was presented in 2017 at the Venice Biennial, um, and The Sleeping Project, originally in 2000, has been presented 
um, several times thereafter, including here in 2014 at the Mori Art Museum. And what, when I started learning about your work, what I was so drawn to was how they, they're so intimate. Um, they really, uh, you know, you are exchanging memories with a stranger, you're exchanging meals, and in the case of um, the sleeping project, you're, in, you're sharing a room. Um, and with Sonic Blossom, it's really the receipt of the song, and again, it's with a stranger. Um, and there are these brief relationships that are forged between the participants, between you as the artist or the performers or the um, assistants who are working with um, the performers. And I guess I would like to hear more about what you think or how you conceive of the role of the performer um, who is in these places, whether it's the person bringing the gifts at the end of When Beauty Visits um, or and of the participants as well as they are going through. Yes, thank you. So I'll speak about the sleeping project first, just because it was done uh, in 2001. The idea came to me uh, when I was riding a train from Paris and Prague uh, as a sort of a graduation gift for myself after graduating from high school. And I was fortunate enough to share the sleeping compartment with uh, an elderly Jewish gentleman from Poland. So through the evening, early evening, he told me about his experience in Auschwitz and how he was the only person who survived the camp, whereas all his family, including his grandparents, his parents, brothers, sisters, and cousin, all died in the camp. And he was on his way back to ask for compensation. So after what he told me, uh, he went to bed peacefully. However, I was the one who wasn't able to go to bed anymore and thinking there were all these people traveling on the similar night and tracked to their death. So um, it took me all these years to come up with a project that deals with the intimacy of, between strangers uh, and share their intimate stories and using the darkness of night as a medium of intimacy. So, so you can see there are two different beds and uh, the, inter the, the people were selected through lottery. So it's not planned. The person comes at nine o'clock after the museum closes at seven. And then it's basically depends on how the conversation goes and how we're going to spend the next seven to eight hours together in the same room in different beds. Um, and you could just imagine when the conversation naturally comes to conclusion, who's going to get up first to go to the bathroom? And then how are you going to get out? Uh, how are you going to appear in front of uh, the stranger after using the bathroom? Are you going to be in your pajama? Are you going to be you know, in different way of dressing, um, just like when you're at home. And then when you get into the beds, uh, are you going to say goodnight to that person? You know, all of these things are not scripted. It really depends on how that moment is. So it's truly like a tangle between two strangers uh, in the darkness of the night. The next project is When Beauty Visits, which is about 15 years later. So um, when you come to the, um, the Giardini, there's a very beautiful small garden designed by um, an Italian architect, um, Carlo Scarpa. And um, I had a, just a simple chair in there. And then a performer who's walking around the gallery making the encounter very similar to Sonic Blossom. But instead of saying, may I give you a gift of song, the, the performer will say, may I take you to a small garden? So this person arrives at the garden, the performer leaves, comes back in a few minutes with a gift. And the gift is a very simple um, envelope with a letter inside. So the performer tells the receiver that this is something just for you and please open it only when you encounter the moment of beauty. So the performer leaves, leaving every 
leaving the person in the garden as long as he or she wants. So it's a, a moment of passing along this question about what is your definition of beauty? And when is this beauty so powerful that you can open this letter to find what is inside? So both projects are about encounter with strangers. And I think it has, um, it takes a lot of courage for both the receiver and the performer to make that uh, trust and encounter in the bridge. Uh, and it happens in a very small section of time. If that bridge is built within a few seconds of the initial encounter, then it's guaranteed to have a very beautiful and, ex and um, experience. Thank you. I, I, I had read and we talked about the sleeping project, but I thank you for reminding me of the genesis of how that project came to be of this encounter on the on the train um, that is, I can see what you, you were not able to sleep after that, but, um, and that you would want to go back to it just to, to sort of discuss this. Um, I, I, these two works are, you know, they, they have that tie, that intimacy, that, uh, um, that building this connection with strangers as we've, we've discussed already. And in the case of, uh, the sleeping project, though, it's it's something that happens, you know, with no one is visible, no one's around other than the two people on it, maybe some assistants who may be in the back, um, making sure everything's running okay. Um, but when Beauty Visits was, I had the opportunity to see it, and it's a, it's a very, you know, the, the garden fills up. There are all these other people who come in um, and see this encounter, and these are things that happen as well with Sonic Blossom. Um, I guess is had you have you discussed with the performers or have people shared with you stories of that of the of the experience of being um almost exposed um and having these intimate uh, encounters and in, in, in such a public yes place? yeah um i'll share with you a very moving story um so one of my friend who was a performer that day because I was doing another project in Asanale and there's no way I could be in both places at the same time. So she told me that um, a gentleman came up to her and made a remark about how beautiful the sound of her ankle bell is. So my friend Sandy said, oh, would you like to come to this garden? So when the gentleman sat down, the church bell started tolling. And um, the and that's when uh, Sandy gave the gift to him, and he started crying uncontrollably after he received this gift without even opening it. He just received the gift while the bell is touring, and Sandy just left him alone in the garden um, to take care of his emotion. A few hours later, when Sandy finished the work, uh, the performance. She was walking through the garden and this gentleman caught up with her, came up and said, I just wanted to tell you that was a very beautiful moment and I'm so sorry that I got so emotional. And the reason why I was so emotional was because exactly 24 hours ago, when the bell was tolling, I scattered my wife's ash into the canal. And um, we got married in Venice 30 years ago and it was her wish to scatter the ash into the canal. So uh, 24 hours later, you, Sandy, standing in front of me and giving me this gift, I really could feel that my wife is here to say goodbye to me. So that's why um, he was so moved. And um, there are many, many moments such as this, which is so uncanny as if even if I want to plan these encounter, it's impossible. I always believe that um, my projects, they are bigger than me and they come from somewhere out there. Uh, and I'm fortunate enough to encounter them and bring them to this world and to share with people who made it possible. So the gentleman also uh, was uh, an instrumental element in making this beautiful moment to happen. Thank you for sharing that story. And in, in fact, I mean, one of the things that has come out of working with Sonic Blossom is also um, a network 
of uh, participants and artists and curators and participants who may see the piece in one place and then you know try to encounter it again elsewhere and even in preparation for today I, you know as, as news of the of our conversation was um, you know making it to different social media platforms I, I got emails say oh yes I got I saw his project in Cleveland or I saw this so it was very nice to hear as people uh, sort of were gathering their own stories not sharing their intimate encounters necessarily but explaining how they had seen it in multiple places and um, you know one of the things that happened in the, as you were in the next slide please um, getting prepared we were you were opening um, a retrospective at the Gropius Bow um, in the spring of this year, um, which is a 30 year career retrospective. And this is also an exhibition that, of course, uh, touches on all of these networks that you build um, through your work and these connections. But um, with the impact of COVID and the, pand and the pandemic and had the closures, this project, of course, has had to be shuttered. So you you've pivoted quickly um, in trying to make it go beyond the gallery space. But I guess if you would be open to sharing about this as the impact of the closure on you as seeing this, this exhibition that um, took so many people to prepare and be installed and then having it closed and then what has that led to um, in the last several months? Yes, yeah, so um, I was in Berlin with my team to install uh, 14 of these projects and out of 14 I also about nine of them are interactive sleeping project is one of them and in fact sleeping project is the only project that i cannot activate in any form or shape <laughs> sleeping in a stranger uh through zoom doesn't really help <laughs> so it could, be a um, yeah. <laughs> it, it could be a little bit of a problem um however sonic blossom immediately um shows the possibility so uh, Stephanie Rosenthal, the director and the curator of the show, says, Miwei, can we do something about Sonic Blossom? This is when, um, next image, please. When we thought, OK, let's do it, because the German government already had sent these rules and regulation to each museum so they could digest it and uh, perform it accordingly. With Sonic Blossom, it's important that uh, the, the singers do not project uh, their, their uh, bodily fluid to the, uh, to the um, receiver. Mm -hmm. However, the sound is very readily transmitted and also the gesture by having a plexiglass in front of the singer. So that's easily solved. On the left image, you see a black, a black costume. So that costume is supposed to be the transformation gown for the singer to wear just the one similar to the one you saw in National Portrait Gallery that Molly was wearing. This time, because of COVID-19, we can't do that. Um, so now we had it on the mannequin and had a little explanation of saying why this is here and where, um, where it's supposed to be before COVID-19. Um, I was pleasantly surprised after speaking to the singers and the receiver how their experience is. They all said the plexiglass division just disappear immediately once the, the performance begin. They just don't see that anymore. So I'm very pleased about this iteration uh, when Sonic Blossom is allowed to perform live in the museum. Thank you. And I wanted to um, bring Birita into the conversation as well. And Jackie, if we can go back one slide, please. Um, we were talking about these, uh, you know, these networks of performers, of course, and uh, of participating um, in these projects. And Birita, you were a vocalist um, who was met going, you were going to perform in Sonic Blossom at the Gropius Bow. And I, and I wanted to hear from you what drew you to Mingwei's work as when you saw the call for auditions that went out for this project? It would be wonderful to hear for you as the vocalist and participant and gift giver, um, how you were drawn to this work and what was it about that really um, that touched you, that made you answer that question? Um, well, practically I heard about it through the school, the audition, and I, 
I instantly was drawn to this idea of combining uh, this, the art of song with um, this, uh, with uh, visual arts at the museum. I think they are two things quite closely related, but not so often joined together. Um, but then as I got to know the project, I signed up for the audition straight away and got to the audition. And from, from getting into the room of the audition, I started realizing that um, the storytelling with, through the songs and most of all, the gift giving is actually the essence of the, of the piece. And so even if, and especially the gift giving, I have experienced that being um, the biggest, um, the most important part of this piece. And so even if that wasn't initially what drew me to the project, it is most certainly was what I will take with me after having performed this piece quite often now, yeah. Thank you. And I'm going to start uh, weaving in the questions that have come in um, while we've been chatting. One of the questions by, um, from Tessa Schultz, thank you, is, um, is it part of the process to gather feedback from the performers and receivers or does it happen more organically? And I know Wei, you've, you've only done it at the Portrait Gallery, but you've done it so, in so many places in Birita, you've probably had um, experiences in the last few months, but it, could you please address that question? I think it's a very organic process because the way it works is that um, as a sonic blossom, we always have two singers within three hours. They don't sing it together. So the first singer will sing it for three uh, iterations, meaning three songs, go back to the green room, the second singer will come out and, and continue the process. So um, the singer, of course, respond to the immediate uh, in the emotion of the recipient. And sometimes they are so emotional that the, I've seen many times when the, um, the, the receivers start tearing up and sometimes even crying out loud, it, it affected the singer so much that uh, the singer could not continue singing. And it takes them a few minutes to gather their emotion again and to make, to go out and make the second encounter. So it's a very emotional and very, uh, um, what, lacking of a better word, volatile in a good way. Uh, way. Um, so um, it's, I always tell the singer to be prepared. And I've told them many stories of uh, the similar story that I share with you. And they say, yes, yes, I know. However, once they encounter it on their own, then they say it's a completely different experience. Right, no, and, and we had similar, we, you shared stories with the performers who were coming here as well. Um, and uh, it was interesting to sort of see how that changed mm -hmm. as the project, since the project was on view for several weeks, how that changed um, with time. And um, there's another question about, um, from Angie Hobson as to, uh, how will your experience in Berlin have a bearing on future projects, even when the distance is not required? Yes, um, I think I'm still processing that <laughs> because we are still in this uh, pandemic together. And uh, interesting thing for me is that in, uh, in Mandarin language, the word crisis is composed of two words. The first word, wei, which means danger, and the second word is ji, which means opportunity. So once there is danger, there is always opportunity. Um, and um, we'll, we'll bring this, uh, so you just saw the danger, which is the, um, the crisis, and we'll bring in um, Birita to talk about the, um, how we solve it with opportunity, which is um, why uh, we have the lovely Birita here to yes. share uh, the idea of invitation for Don. Yes, so Birita, if you could please let us explain invitation for Don to those who are with us today who haven't had a chance to, to participate, please. Yes. Um, well, it's, um, it's a project in itself. Um, it has its own, you know, um, rights, um, but still it is m very much inspired by the Sonic Blossom. And it is uh, the same gift giving, but uh, because of the lockdown, it is uh, through via Zoom. 
and it is um, without the beautiful artwork of the cloak of the, of the rope that uh, that was made for the sonic blossom in berlin and it's without the accompaniment of the piano it's without the um, acoustic and the ambience of of the Gropiusbau. so actually the the only things left is the voice of the singer and the song the story of the song and the interaction between the singer and the person receiving the song Wonderful. And um, Mingwei, sorry, I, were you about to say something before I interrupt? I was going to, no, okay. I was going to invite um, our viewers if they could, wouldn't mind switching to um, the active speaker view on Zoom. And uh, Birita is going to treat us to uh, invitation for Don this afternoon. And then we will go back to the Q&A. <laughs> Thank you, Birita. Yes. Um... I am very happy to again have the opportunity to, to, to share a song and um, it is a song which I consider an invitation for dawn and it's a song from the Faroe Islands. Um, it's a song about a bird that has been caged and silenced and it's sitting in this cage and thinking back on memories of freedom, of pleasure and um, sinking deeper and deeper into hopelessness. And then right before there is no hope left, the cage is opened again and the bird can sing and fly freely. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sure people are clapping in there, but you can't hear them. So I will do a virtual clap. Thank you. That was really um, lovely. And I, you had these appointments with people as they were going through. And I guess how how is that for you to perform in this in this space that we are in now, um, but through this process of you know as opposed to the gallery space, which is what you had. Um, 
signed up for and then yeah. um, and then to be at home um, or I assume at your home um, having these encounters with strangers still with strangers um, but through in this format How? yeah um, well first of all it was a uh, at the time I was in a shock because of the big change in my life you know and that's I think especially as a performing artist we had a you know a brutal um, yeah encounter with this fact that there were the whole calendar was just stripped out and so I was feeling quite empty personally um, but when this offer came uh, to because everyone else just postponed or um, chose to um, to um, not make things happen you know um, so it was a great opportunity to still have work um, and then having to have to meet people, strangers, so intimately actually through um, in their living rooms. I was in the start a bit nervous about it, but it became something that helped me get through the lockdown actually, um, because I didn't really have to offer much um, because I just gave a song and I received so much energy and and gratefulness and and sometimes even they would show me a picture or they would even sing to me back to me or um yeah it, it was just really a, a restoring thing to to be part of the invitation for dawn yeah thank you for sharing that i know that um i i participated in invitation for dawn and i was Felt, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, it felt, um, I mean, it still continues to feel a particularly um, touching and healing in some way um, to have these interactions. And we have a question about, um, I guess, how music and healing and ways of art have um, ways of bridging cultural gaps. Um, and I don't know, um, this is from Ethan Fogarty, how do we, I don't know if either of you would like to answer, but maybe Ming Wei, start off and then if Birita, if you'd like to jump in. Um, how do we, you know, working with particular modes of expression and how do we find ways of bridging cultural gaps between different nations mm. through these projects? Thank you. Yes, very good question. So looking at Sonny Blossom, um, there are a lot of different cultural mixes here. So starting from Viennese uh, composer, Schubert, 1800, and uh, a Taiwanese American artist uh, who think about this as a gift. And then we have singers in Berlin, um, people like Birita, also from Faroe Island, to share this, uh, this gift with people, let's say in Tokyo or in Taipei. So all the leader are in German. And uh, so how do these people appreciate or bridge the gap? I think it's the reason why people are so moved, even without understanding German. It's because we're all human. We all know how to receive a gift, a generous and a genuine gift from a stranger. And it is that that uh, naturally connects us together as a human being. Thank you. Birita, did you, since you've, encountered people across the world <laughs> um, from, from home. Um, how, how do you think, how do you see these projects or projects such as, as Invitation for Dawn? Um, yeah, it's, I've, I haven't seen that much of the world. I've stayed a lot in Europe, but the, the past months I've been all around the world. Right. <laughs> a lot, you know, in, I've been in America, different states in America. I've been to Singapore, I've been to, you know, Taiwan, all around and in some cases the people wouldn't really speak much English and I would try to go through the explanation of the song a bit but then I would just go fast to the song because what I experienced every time was that um, even if I would sing in Faroese or Norwegian the people would um, understand somehow and I sang a song about spring for example and the woman said, I don't understand um, Norwegian, but um, spring, I felt spring in my living room. That was spring, you know. So that's the beauty of music also. It's just an international language. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you. 
Uh, we have a few minutes left here and I realize that um, I think we're all still in active speaker view. If you want to see the three of us talking, please change it back to whichever the gallery view I think on Zoom is the best one, just so that um, we don't pop in, your screens aren't changing too much. Um, I think uh, we have another question about how the pandemic is inspiring ideas for new projects. And I think Invitation for Dawn is one of these Ming Wei, but in terms of being um, specific to these socially distanced times, and again, Invitation for Dawn works with this, but are the ways that mass and distance affect our interactions with strangers? Or are there other, I guess, you can, projects in the works that may um, attend to this or that may address uh, this in a, in a more direct way. Okay. Um, <laughs> may I do tell a us. Bit of self promotion? <laughs> <laughs> this is terrible. But um, anyway, this morning, uh, the Metropolitan Museum just announced the participation uh, of my work with Bill T. Jones, a great and wonderful Bill T. Jones, the dance dancer, choreographer. Uh, and uh, this is a, call, a project called Our Labyrinth. But to, in response to your question about the pandemic, is that originally this dance was supposed to be performed live in front of live audience for about 12, uh, six hours per day uh, for different dancers, each one at a time. However, because of the, um, the, the security, the, send, uh, uh, the health reason, we are going to do it live stream. Uh, and uh, so no uh, viewers are around the dancer. And then the collaboration with Bill is really fantastic because he curated these amazing dancers of different background. Instead of me selecting the dancer who I'm familiar with, but we have street dancers, we have New York City Ballet um, superstar, we have drag performer, and uh, we also have a sound component to it. So because now it's live streaming, we need to add something to the work because the audience are not there in space and time, but they're in different parts of the world. I'm very excited about this. It's coming up in uh, September 13, uh, and we'll see what happens. We'll see, and I guess we'll see what happens with that. But you've seen what happens with Invitation for Dawn, and um, how is it to see your work, I guess, in this virtual space? I mean, you came up with the idea to make it virtual, but um, were there surprises? Mm. Is there something that you know? Were there yeah? Were there surprises to how it ended up turning out in a way? Yes, I'm usually very skeptic about um, works uh, that is th through video, uh, just because I'm not well versed in that medium. Um, and um, so I'm actually pleasantly surprised. <laughs> and so uh, there are a lot of people helping me out with this journey. And, uh, and it's a really an adventure uh, that is uh, bringing me and helping me to grow and to learn about how how to do this in a way that still keeps in credity, integrity of the work and, um, and make it available to people um, when they're not physically there. Yeah, that's wonderful. And Birita, for you as, um, you know, not only as part of Invitation for Dawn, but as a vocalist uh, who's, you know, you've been doing lessons from home, how has this virtual space affected your I guess your con how you conceive of or how you what your I conceptualize sorry that's the word I meant um of these virtual interactions and for your for the rest of your art not just as part of invitation for dawn well I think um through invitation for dawn I, I was also skeptical in the start I must admit and I was so pleasantly surprised so um for things such as uh, invitation for dawn I have seen that it works and it works it's, you know, the, there were people who could experience this art, uh, piece of art because it was virtual, virtual. They wouldn't be able to get into a museum maybe. So you can reach much further. Um, but I think also having this past months, having had to um, have lessons and interaction via Zoom, I think it also just teaches us to appreciate um, real life um, conversation and interaction even more because there are things and maybe especially with music that can't be 
and done via Zoom. And uh, so, yeah, that's also, I think, at least for some time, we will be very much appreciating and meeting up again and making music live and being able to perform it also. So thank you. Thank you so much. If, do you have questions for each other while I have you here? <laughs> I, 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 do you, did you actually ever meet in person is the question. Did you, the two of you meet in person, you and Ming Wei or? Well, only during the audition. <laughs> only during the audition. <laughs> right, exactly, during the audition. Um, yes. so, so are there any questions you have for each other? I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the floor. Um, <laughs> well, this will and, and yeah, ask all the questions. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. No, really, we're truly grateful to both of you and to everyone who joined us um, this uh, afternoon to share their lunch or dinner or wherever you are in the world. Um, and thank you so much, uh, Mingwei um, and Birita for joining us. And Dorothy, take thank it Thank you. I want to reiterate Leslie's thanks, um, Birita and Mingwei for transporting us. What a restorative hour. You've reminded us that we're all closer than we often feel in this pandemic. Um, and that you've reminded us of the power of music to bring us into community. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. <laughs> and um, for all who have joined us today, thank you for being with us. And please remain part of our National Portrait Gallery family virtually. Jackie Petito will be emailing all of you with our upcoming programs. Um, so keep an eye out for those. Um, thank you all. Be safe, be well, and, um, and stay in touch with us. <laughs>